Hello, welcome to this course on developing RESTful APIs with JAX-RS. My name is Kaushik Kotagal, and in this course, I'll teach you how to write RESTful web service applications using the JAX-RS technology. To learn how to write RESTful APIs or RESTful services using JAX-RS, you essentially need to learn two things. First, you'll need to learn about RESTful APIs itself. And secondly, you'll need to learn how to actually implement them using JAX-RS. Accordingly, this course is split into two important sections. The first few tutorials of this course introduce you to RESTful web services. It explains the concepts and the best practices. There are a few standard things to keep in mind when building RESTful web services. We'll learn about them first. I'll also walk you through developing a RESTful API for a sample application. We'll build a simple social media messaging application throughout this course. So this application will have some of the basic functionalities of similar sites like Facebook or Google+. Nothing too complex, but this should be enough to get us started on exploring all the different possibilities when it comes to API design and implementation. Now, after learning the concepts, will implement some of these features of our social media messaging RESTful web service using JAX-RS. We'll add features as we go, as we learn more about JAX-RS itself, and we'll write code to implement those features. RESTful web services have recently grown in popularity. I think now is a great time to learn about them and work on them. I hope you're excited to get started. So let's start with web services. So what are web services? Web services are services that are exposed to the internet for programmatic access. They're online APIs that you can call from your code. So think about this. When you call an API when writing Java code, you basically add the jars or the classes to your class path. Everything executes inside a single machine, in a single environment. In the case of web services, however, you have different pieces of code deployed in different machines and they call methods of each other over the network. You must have seen different Facebook or Twitter apps. You must have seen games which can post to your Facebook wall, even though those games are not designed by Facebook themselves. How can they do that? How can they post to a wall of a completely different system, a completely different application? They do this by calling online APIs. Companies like Facebook or Twitter, they publish web services that let other developers call them from their code. So other application developers can actually write code to consume these services and they can post things on Facebook or Twitter. They can read or access data from Facebook or Twitter using the APIs or the web services that Facebook or Twitter have provided. In a way, they're similar to web pages. You see, Twitter has a website at twitter.com. When you access twitter.com on your browser, you get an HTML response that lets you read and write tweets. They have some HTML elements for the data, and they also have all the styling and CSS. This is because that web page that you see is meant for human consumption. They, they know that there's actually a human being who is behind a browser on a laptop or a device who is reading those tweets. So they want to make sure it's formatted properly so that it's easy to access. But Twitter also has this other URL called api.twitter.com. It does a lot of the same things as twitter.com, but it behaves a bit differently. For instance, this api.twitter.com gives you a response which does not have HTML or CSS. It contains data but it is returned in an XML or a JSON format. It's bare bones data. And there are specific URLs for different operations. This is what the developers can use from their code to read or write data to Twitter. Since it deals with just the bare bones data, it's actually very easy for the developers to actually parse the data and then convert it into their objects in their code, their data structures, so that they can use it later. There's no need for all the fancy HTML and CSS in this case, right? So this is what we'll be learning in this course. So this is what we'll be building, the online API part of it. Of course, there are many ways in which you can build such online APIs or web services. 
one way to build them is using RESTful APIs, which is what we're going to be learning in this course. RESTful web services or RESTful APIs are a type of web services that are modern, they are lightweight, and they use a lot of concepts behind HTTP, which is, as you know, it's the technology that drives the web. There is another type of web services that you can choose to write your services in, and that's called SOAP web services. There is a separate Java Brains course on SOAP web services in the link provided in the description, but this course is gonna be only about REST. Let's talk about web service characteristics. When you talk about web services in general, there are a few characteristics about them that we have to keep in mind. First, they're all web services, so the exchange of data happens over the web, or HTTP. The client sends an HTTP request, and the server returns back an HTTP response. In this way, they're very similar to websites, like we discussed, but instead of the response being complete web pages with all the formatting and the styling, only the data is returned because the client is a program and it's not a human being, so it doesn't need all the formatting. The client could then have its own logic to present the data to the users in a presentable format, right? So this could still have the formatting. There could still be a human being who consumes the client's product, but the exchange between the web service client and the web service server is usually bare bones data. The next characteristic of web services is the protocol used. Now, what is a protocol? When a web service client makes a request to the web service endpoint, there are usually messages that are transmitted from one machine to another, right? The client makes a request, it sends a message to the server, and the server makes a response, it returns a response, and that message is sent back to the client. So these messages need to be in a format that both the client and the server can understand obviously. Now, this format is sometimes referred to as the protocol. So, this protocol is sometimes standardized in some web services. For example, the SOAP web service uses a standard protocol for all these communications, which is the SOAP. So, SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. Well, it used to stand for that, and the name is now discontinued, but you're stuck with the acronym, but that's what it is, right? SOAP Web Services use the SOAP protocol. So this is a specific format of messages, right, in the SOAP Web Service world. So there are, uh, you know, the messages are in an XML format, and there are specific rules which detail how that XML should be, right? The client and the server needs to talk to each other using the SOAP protocol only in the case of SOAP Web Services. Now, what's the protocol in the case of REST? Well, there's none. A REST client can send messages using XML, or it can send messages using JSON, or text format, or any other new format. As long as the client and the server understand each other, they're happy. There are no rules. Let's look at the next characteristic, how the communication happens. We saw that RESTful web services are web services, that means that the request and the response is happening over the web, right? They're always exchanged, almost always exchanged over HTTP. But in HTTP, there are different methods that are available. You would have heard of the get method, the post method, the put method, and so on. Now, what methods would you need to use to exchange data between the client and the server? We know that it's HTTP, but what is the method that we need to use? What's the standard there in the case of REST? The answer is there is none. Messages can be exchanged in any HTTP method or all HTTP methods. There are some guidelines which tell you when you're designing your API or your web service what method to choose depending on what the operation is, but there is no rule as such. You can pick any method, actually. Let's look at the next characteristic, service definition. What's service definition? When you're coding in Java and you need to call a method of a library class. You need to know certain things about that library. You need to know the name of the class. You need to know what's the methods that are available. You need to know what's the input arguments. You need to know what the return type is. So you need to know a little bit about the API, right? You need to know about the library, about the jar that you're using. In the web service world, a similar concept applies, right? You're making a call to a web service. You need to know what that web service does. Right? You need to know 
what's the operation, what's the input argument, what's the return type, similar stuff. So this is typically referred to as service definition, right? It's a definition about the service. In the SOAP web service world, the service definition is typically called by a name, WSDL, W-S-D-E-L, right? It's a document which defines what the web service does, right? It has all the details. It has what are the methods, what's the return type, input arguments, output, all that stuff. And this document is made available to all clients. So when a client gets hold of this WSDL, they have all the information they would ever need about the SOAP web service. Right? So that's the standard document in the case of SOAP Web Services. Now, what's the standard in the case of REST? You might have guessed the answer now. Yes, there is none. Most web services, most RESTful web services have little to no documentation. And if they have documentation, it's very likely in a format that we can read from right human beings can read from there'll be a you know a web page listing what the what the operations are and things like that so there'll be it's common to have restful web services with little to no documentation and in fact the best design restful web services wouldn't even need any documentation this is a topic of a much later tutorial we're going to get there but for now consider that there is no such formal service definition available in the RESTful web service world. There is something called WADL, W-A-D-L, which is kind of an equivalent of the WSDL in the SOAP web service world. But WADL didn't really catch on. You don't have a lot of users using or implementing WADL. I have been using RESTful web services for quite some time now, and I still haven't encountered, you know, having to use WADL to do something, right? It's not that popular. So there are no standards as such in the RESTful web service world. Okay, so I could go on with this discussion, but let me stop here for a bit. You might have gotten the idea. You're probably wondering, is it really true? There is. There are no rules in the RESTful web service world, right? There's no protocol standard. There's no communication channel standard. There's no service definition standard. Does the RESTful web services have any rules at all? Do you even have to read up anything to define and build a RESTful web service? Could my grandmother have built a RESTful web service? Well, based on what we have seen so far, anything goes. There are no rules. How is it possible? In contrast, a SOAP web service have strict rules defining each and every characteristic that we have seen. So what's going on here? Well, the reason for this is actually very simple. All SOAP web services follow this thing called the SOAP specification. So what's a specification? A specification is basically a set of rules that dictate what something should be, right? So there is a SOAP web service specification, which is a set of rules that dictate what every SOAP web service should be. It was actually designed by a committee and it's actually still being maintained by a committee, right? So the specification lays out all the rules, including the rules that we have just discussed and much more. If a SOAP web service does not follow even one of these rules, it's by definition not a SOAP web service at all. It's as simple as that, right? There are the bunch of rules which every SOAP web service have to follow. And if it doesn't follow any one of these rules, that's it. It's not a SOAP web service, right? RESTful web services, on the other hand, do not have any specification. It's a concept. It's an idea. There is no specification, no committee to tell you what's right and what's wrong. The term REST was introduced by a guy named Roy Fielding in his doctoral thesis way back in the year 2000. REST actually stands for Representational State Transfer. And actually, it's not about web service at all. Representational State Transfer is actually an architecture style. Let's say you're working on an architecture of a new application. There are certain decisions you need to take. There are certain choices you have to make, certain criteria you have to think about. REST consists of a coordinated set of these criteria and constraints that you can use to guide you in your application architecture. It's a set of guidelines that work well together, right? It's a style of architecture. You can use the style of architecture for any application. 
However, if you apply the style and these guidelines when architecting a web service, you have drum roll, RESTful web services. And therein lies the difference. Unlike SOAP web services, where a committee tells what you should be doing, in the RESTful web service world, you don't have any strict rule books to follow, right? You can actually have a spectrum. It's common to hear some people say that some web services are completely RESTful and some web services are not fully RESTful. Really, I'm not kidding. And the goal when building RESTful web services is to make it as RESTful as practically possible. Okay, so there are no strict rules. These are guidelines and we try to follow as many of these guidelines as possible. But the main factor you need to think about when designing a REST API is to make it easy for your consumers. This is a topic that we're gonna revisit again and again when we're designing an API, but this is really important. Since we don't have a specification, since we don't have a rule book, the idea is to make it easy for the consumers, easy for your clients, as well as easy for you to maintain your web service. In the next tutorials, we'll start learning more about these constraints and understand what good RESTful web services look like and why. Thanks for watching.